Good afternoon and welcome everybody to today's online panel discussion on the subject of glass and contemporary art. This event is part of a programme of online discussions, con Conversations on Glass by Apice, which is taking place as part of the fourth edition of the Venice Glass Week, which is the international festival dedicated to the art of glass, taking place here in Venice and Murano from the 5th to the 13th of September 2020. My name is Camilla Purden and I work as the festival coordinator uh, of the Venice Glass Week, which is organized by a committee made up of five institutions and organizations here in Venice with particular expertise in the field of glass. They are Le Stanza del Vetro with the Fondazione Giorgio Cini, the Fondazione Musei Civici di Venezia, the Istituto Veneto di Scienze Lettere ed Arti, the Comune di Venezia, and the Murano Glass Consortium. This year, for the first time, we're really happy to be presenting a series of seven online panel discussions, Conversations on Glass by Apice, which is one of the most prestigious transportation companies in the world for works of art and a special expertise in transporting and handling works in glass. Every day during the festival, we're presenting discussions on various topics relating to the field of glass, involving high profile speakers from Italy and abroad in the world of glass from around the world with the aim of providing a platform for reflections and discussion about the world of glass. The conversations are taking place in English rather than Italian. And this is because this year, especially because of the travel restrictions that are unfortunately presenting many of our potential visitors uh, from coming to be with us here in Venice, we wanted with Apice to provide a platform for engaging with those of you who are not able to be in, in Venice or Italy and who are joining us from all around the world. So wherever you are, welcome. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, we are streaming live at the moment on the Venice Glass Week YouTube channel, and we warmly invite anybody who'd like to ask questions to do so via the chat function of your YouTube channel. So fire away with any questions, and then at the end of the conversation, our moderator will put those to the speakers. So we, yes, we, we warmly welcome you to do that. Um, as I mentioned, today's conversation is the sixth in the series, and it's titled Glass and Contemporary Art. Um, before I hand over and introduce our, our moderator and our speakers, I'd just like to um, introduce our sponsor, um, represented today by Fabiano Pansironi, Apice's Managing Director, to say a few words. So, um, Fabiano, maybe you'd like just to, to take over for a moment. I think you're... Hello, everyone. Yes. everyone. For Apice, which has been supporting the Venice Glass Week from the beginning, it's a privilege to be able to sponsor this series of conversation between museums, uh, operators, artists, uh, technicians, and collectors this year too. Contemporary glass works are often very complex and particularly fragile. Our passion and organization that has developed since uh, 1973 allows us to uh, be able to guarantee the fantastic work of the past and our times to be admired like in every part of the world. Through particular care for packaging and for the processing of the shipping and handling. It's a pleasure for me to participate in this panel discussion today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fabiano, thank you. Um, so now I'd like to um, just give a brief word of introduction to our moderator today. Um, we are so lucky to have Rachel Spence, uh, arts writer and poet, who is undoubtedly one of the finest and most highly regarded arts writers of our, of our time. Um, Rachel writes about visual art chiefly for the Financial Times, which, as I'm sure many of you will know, is renowned worldwide for its outstanding and authoritative coverage of the arts and culture. Venice, uh, Rachel lived in Venice for nine years from 2002 to 2011. And I think I'm right in saying that um, she regards it as her second home. And I know that although she's very happy or she says she's happy to be joining us today online to moderate, I think she's saying that through slightly gritted teeth as I'm sure she'd rather be here in person. Um, but hopefully this time next year, Rachel, you'll be with us. Um, anyway, as a long-term Venetian resident, um, Rachel has written many articles about glass from Murano and beyond. She's also written essays about artists, including Vicken Parsons uh, and others. Um, and her poetry, her beautiful poetry publications include her collection, Bird of Sorrow, and her new pamphlet, Call and Response, which are both highly to be recommended. But um, Rachel, thank you so much for joining. And I know you're going to introduce our speakers now and then fire away. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Camilla. Um, yeah, I'm really delighted to be here um, for so many reasons. 
I do feel like an honorary Venetian um, and as a journalist um, and as an honorary Venetian I've always really supported the Venice Glass Week because it's a fantastic initiative that has kind of built a bridge between Venice and Murano and the wider world and I think both both sides have and are really benefiting from that encounter. Um, I'm not in any way an expert on glass, but it is true that um, I've written quite a lot of articles about it. And the very first article that I ever wrote for the Financial Times, uh, and the first article I wrote on art or design was on Venetian glass. And it was an interview with Massimo Michelozzi, who's a great Venetian glass maker. And about four months ago, I had the pleasure of interviewing his daughters who are carrying on the family tradition um, who were children when I wrote that first article, uh, and now they make their own glass. So, so I do feel very connected to Murano. Um, but I have a really distinguished panel with me, which is um, a huge honour to be with you all. Um, so I'm just going to do some brief introductions, and then uh, we'll start our, our conversation. So um, first, uh, Sudarshan Shetty, uh, who's joining us from Mumbai in India, Sudarshan is one of the most exciting um, and I would say visionary contemporary artists working today. Um, he's renowned for large scale sculptures and installations. Um, he works in many different media. His work's been shown all over the world, including at the Biennials of Sydney and Vancouver, the Guggenheim in New York, the Pompidou in Paris, the National Museum of Art in Delhi, and at the Kochi Museum Spionale in Kerala in India. He also directed, curated an edition of the Kochi Museris Biennale, which I was lucky enough to see uh, and write about. And it was quite extraordinary um, because Sudarshan brought together, made a truly multidisciplinary Biennale with theater and dance and poetry, as well as uh, what we think of as, as visual art. Um, and I would say he's a truly poetic thinker. Uh, I think maybe the, one work I saw of his recently was a film called Shunya Ga um, from 2017, which is a sort of dreamscape shot in a, in a quarry. Um, it's, it's beautiful and it turns on the lines of a 12th century poet who asks, who is asleep and who is awake in this city, this home, this settlement, this fortress of nothingness? Um, and Sudarshan's work I think it's fair to say is often interrogating ideas of absence and nothingness um, and the kind of uh, liminality of our physical bodies between absence and presence. So in a sense, it seems extraordinary that he only started to work in glass, I think four years ago um, for the first time. Is that right, Sudarshan? Um, and uh, he's worked two times on Murano with the Foundation Berengo um, and showed last year in the Glass Dress exhibition. Um, then we have Mario Codignato, who is a truly distinguished curator in international contemporary art. Um, Mario is perfectly placed to talk about the relationship between glass in Venice and glass in the wider contemporary art world. He was born in Venice, um, but since then his roles have included the directorship of Madre, Museum of Contemporary Art in Naples. Uh, he has been chief curator of the House of 21 in Vienna, where his shows included Oliafa Eliasson and Sterling Ruby. Um, and most uh, relevantly, perhaps for us, he curated Fragile, an exhibition at the Stanze del Vetro in Venice um, of works in glass by artists as varied as Marcel Duchamp, Joseph Boyce and Ai Weiwei. Um, and currently, uh, Mario is director of the Anish Kapoor Foundation. Um, and then with us, we also have Kuhn van Mekelen, um, who is an internationally renowned artist and curator. Kuhn describes himself as an eternal migrant who travels the world looking for answers to fundamental questions of identity, diversity, globalization, and human rights. Um, crucially, uh, Crucial to his oeuvre is the chicken, which may seem a, a humble bird, but in, uh, in Kuhn's work, it reveals itself both as an artwork and as a metaphor for society. And his project to crossbreed different strains of chicken is a paradigm 
for the fluidity necessary if our world is to sustain itself. Um, from a glass point of view, he's worked with the Barengo Foundation on Murano for many years, making his own artworks and curating exhibitions, um, including the acclaimed glass dress series of shows, which I would say put Murano on the, on the map of the international art world um, and really presented glass as a, as a very uh, widespread um, and popular medium for, for art that was uh, clearly you know, at the most cutting edge of the contemporary scene. And currently alongside Nadia Roma, who I will come to now, he is curator of Unbreakable, a show of more than 60 women artists at the Barengo Foundation art space on Murano. But finally, last but by no means least, Nadia Roma. Um, Nadia is an artistic director and producer. She's the founder of uh, a charity based in the UK called Art Action Change. And she's currently launching um, Everything I Want, which is a hybrid platform that champions beautiful objects which adhere to both rigorous ethical and aesthetic guidelines. Um, she's also worked as a journalist for the Condé Nast Publication Group. And uh, alongside um, Kuhn, she is also curator of Unbreakable, uh, the Women in Glass exhibition at uh, the Fondazione Berengo on Murano. So um, I think it's a great panel. And uh, I'll just start um, by saying that I think the conversation between glass and contemporary art hasn't always been super smooth. Um, there's still a tendency to view glass as a quote unquote decorative art and to be quite surprised when it strays into the, the repertoire, if you like, of, of fine artists such as uh, Sudarshan uh, or Kuhn. Um, and, uh, I think I'm going to start by um, asking, talking first with Sudarshan. And Sudarshan, if you could talk a little bit, um, given how your practice with these ideas always of, you know, absence and emptiness and, um, yeah, uh, fragility, if you like, um, you, you didn't start to work with glass until um, really quite late in your, in your career. What, what drew you to, to glass um, in the end? Uh, well, it was uh, it was a chance uh, meeting with Adriano Berengo actually uh, in one of my shows uh, that he invited me to come, and I had no clue where I, I mean what I'm what I was going to do. And uh, as much as I was excited at the possibilities of uh, what I could, uh, you know, you know, how I could kind of explore a material, uh, which is glass in this case. Uh, uh, I quickly learned after having been there that, you know, it was also about the limitations of, you know, that material in itself, that uh, that became a kind of a, 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 a kind of a starting point in some ways. And also looking at, uh, you know, the properties of the material, so to say, is that, uh, uh, that you know, like a very accepted ideas about, you know, its fragility and transparency. Apart from that, I also learned that, uh, Glass is a material that uh, that that can be considered, uh, which is in between a liquid and a solid state, uh, which all, almost became a metaphorical idea for me to be able to kind of you know approach it in some ways. That it is neither here or there, and how do you kind of place it in that sense that it it it, it has uh, the flowing uh, kind of. Uh, you know, property of a liquid. At the same time, it kind of presents itself in its stasis, uh, so to say. Uh, so this is something that coincided with a lot of the ideas that I was thinking about my own work, that how do you kind of uh, uh, present things in its extremes. Uh, so take an example to, to say that, you know, I want to create a spectacle of a show or an object and include the idea of its collapse, collapsibility into the work. Uh, and can they you know, coexist with each other in a way that it becomes a part of a singular experience of that object? Uh, and this idea itself comes from a lot of my studies uh, uh, of uh, you know, uh, traditional Indian art, so to say. And a lot of these ideas uh, are also come from my study of poetry between the 12th and the 15th century. Uh, that uh, that very often than not, 
uh, uh, one line, the first line, you know, there's this thing of Doha that you just uh, translated a bit for me. Uh, the, the form of Doha is two liners, that the first line very often than not presents us with an idea, uh, an image, and uh, the second line uh, very often comes with a uh, diverse image that they may not have, uh, you know, uh, a relationship. But the way the poetry is built, it cannot be separated. Uh, there can be no separation. That kind of bo both those extreme positions or multiple positions uh, come together to create some sort of uh, evocation that could be outside of the words in itself that is being represented. So in this case, class, in that sense, for me, uh, the material itself presents uh, itself with those uh, extreme positions, you know. So uh, that's what I took as a thing and kind of, you know, move into a metaphorical space uh, with the properties of the glass. Thank you. That's a really beautiful um, evocation, I think, and just captures the extraordinary um, kind of transformative fluid qualities of glass, which I think is why we're all so captivated by it as a material. Um, Mario, maybe I could turn to you. Um, uh, as somebody who's, who's curated um, art by, um, glass art by artists from all over the world, um, but also as somebody with your, um, with your background and your knowledge of uh, of Venice and, and its great glass heritage. I mean, how would you say contemporary artists are, you know, are, are beginning to develop an art of glass um, you know, beyond, beyond Murano, beyond Venice, onto a much more um, global stage? Well, uh, interestingly enough, the exhibition you mentioned that I don't know the uh, curator, Alessandro Salvetro, uh, was trying to, to show the other side of Murano in a way. Uh, I invited and showed uh, works by artists who never worked in Murano or, uh, or works that were not made in Murano, where glass was used as a, as a ready made. So, glass that were bought either in, you know, industrially, in, you know. In, in, in shops or, or, or glass, which was found like a found, like a found object. Uh, but uh, in a way, like Sebastian said, uh, you, you, you could tell, you could say that uh, glass is possibly the most flexible of materials, not only materially, but also metaphorically. Uh, it's transparent, uh, it's fragile, but at the same time it's very strong. Uh, it, it allow you to see, uh, you know, uh, beyond, but at the same time protects. It, it, it makes like a membrane between you and, you know, and what is on the other side of the glass. And uh, it has a sense of eternity, even though uh, it's a man-made material. So it's full of contradiction and it's full of oxymoron, if you like. Uh, that make it, makes it, I imagine, very, very interesting for artists to, to use because the moment they decide to, to use glass, so many metaphors, so many um, mythical uh, issues uh, inevitably are, are taken into, into, into consideration. And, uh, and I imagine for an artist, it must be quite difficult because you have to deal with a lot of... Uh, with a lot of uh, a lot of these issues, and uh, so uh, I think you know. I think there is, a, of course, a difference between you know creating uh, works in glass with with uh, you know with the maestros in in, in Murano, and uh, and of course you know creating a work uh, you know by using glass for whatever reason, uh, but a glass that you know either you bought at the shop or or, or, or you found uh, or you found in the street, but. You know the the, the quality the, the reasons uh, why glass is used tend to be the same. This incredible range of 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 of, uh, of metaphorical meaning that uh, glass you know inevitably uh, rises. Right. I think that's um that's a good a good point to turn to you, Kuhn, because when we we spoke earlier this week, um, and it was fascinating to hear you have really two 
two kind of heads on, as it were, today. Maybe you have more than, more than two heads. But you're both an artist. You've worked in glass. You've made sculptures in glass. And you've also curated um, a lot in glass, um, uh, with particularly with, with, uh, with reference to, to glass stress. Um, but when we spoke earlier, you, you told me that I think maybe the first piece you made in glass was a hybrid piece, which was a glass, was it an egg with like legs of metal? Which sounded very complicated. And I think you presented this to Adriano Berengo as a, as a concept. Um, and I imagine that presented huge challenges um, because it wasn't just the difficulty of working in glass, but of working in glass and adding another material. Could you tell us something about how you, you, uh, you negotiated that challenge? Uh, yes, I, um, um, it, it is many years ago, and uh, like you said in the introduction, you know, my work is actually crossbreeding, and I think crossbreeding as being the metaphor of diversity. And uh, I do this, I do this with the with the chicken program. So from every country selecting a chicken and crossbreeding. So that in itself is already saying that you need uh, the other to survive. So through that, um, I, I, was, I, I was developing uh, the walking egg, which was actually in the beginning a wooden egg with iron legs. But when I came to Murano, and it was actually coincidence to the, I had another show in Bologna. So I came to the, to the glass island of Murano and immediately I saw the fragility of life, which is representing in the uh, in, in glass, and for me, especially in transparent glass. And um, so the egg as being the source of life and the beginning of life, I immediately saw we have to tr to translate this wooden egg into a glass egg, and to attach it with the with iron legs. So the philosophy of the whole world, uh, world became stronger. And I think this is something which um, in contemporary art is, is the case. If you use a material, uh, you have to use that material as um, that it makes sense to use the material. And for me, first of all, glass, when it is transparent, you, you can't really see it. So the idea of transparency is that you can look through it. Uh, it only becomes visible when you when you break it, and when you break it in a very beautiful way, it becomes a scar, and it 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 shows life in one way or another. But also the fact that when you make glass, that you need engagement, that you need a team, that you need people around the fire who is like a, uh, like the fire of Dante when when you know you come into the, the to the circle and you can you can be burned very easily with glass. Because I want to say that the material of glass is very difficult. When you work too long, you lose the glass. It becomes a, a senseless object. So you have, to, you have to cut at the right moment. And then you have a piece. So for me, all these elements are so important. The engagement, that means you, can, you can't make it alone. You need a team. You have to translate your thoughts into uh, an object that is also made by a glass master. So in one way or another, there is the, the idea of the melting between, between uh, the maestro and, and, and the artist has to become one soul in one body, two souls, sorry, in one body. And, and, and so that, for me, it's a logic step to use glass regarding the content of my work. And so it's beautifully put. I think that that relationship between the, the maestro and the artist is um, so mysterious and um, beautiful. I've been lucky enough to watch a few artists and designers work with maestri in the furnaces and it never fails to just enchant me. Um, Nadia, let's come to you. Um, I know that you've, you've really been um, a driving force behind Unbreakable, which is a show of um, more than 60 women artists from around the world, all of whom um, have made work in, in glass. Um, could you tell us a bit about why you felt um, Unbreakable was such an important project um, and, and you know, what you feel maybe it's achieved, achieved and achieving? Well, I think, you know, for me, there, there's, diff there's different things. Um, I, got to, I got into glass in the past few years 
and kind of by chance. Uh, first of all, by working with an artist uh, who is not included in this show because she hasn't worked uh, yet in, the, in, in this studio, her name is Flavie Odi. And Flavie has developed a whole body of work. Um, she was uh, an architect by training, very interested by how uh, glass has been used way back by, at the time of Ms. Vandero in architecture. And then by, because it's her, you know, she's, she's uh, early 30s, then because by the fact that we have glass everywhere in our lives, you know, we are living surrounded by all these devices that are made of glass. And she got really into this uh, geology of glass and uh, this question of the liquidity, which is something I'm really passionate about. You know, we're all made of liquids. We come from liquids, we are born in liquids. And uh, the glass is li liquid. It's, it's between, it's a state between liquid and solid. And, uh, and glass materialized the liquidity of things. There's actually a feminist movement, movement called Hydra Feminism that is developing all this, uh, all this concept. And there is, when I got the first, for the first time to see glass in the making here in Murano, in a real fornace, not in one of the tourist fornace, because I did that years ago and that didn't got me into glass at all, that actually pushed me away. But when I got the opportunity to come here like at 7 a.m. in the morning, taken to see a maestro creating his art, is the alchemy, and this is something that Flavi was talking to me about that I was not really getting it, but when you see it, it's the alchemy of this transformation of the material that is fascinating. And I think it's fascinating because it brings, big, brings us back to something that is really uh, in depth in us, you know, in, ingrained in us, uh, that goes back to thousands, uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, there, there's really something um, mystic about the creation of glass. Um, so there is this aspect. There's the fact uh, that I was you know, quite fascinated by some of the pieces that has been realized here at the Fondation, uh, the studio behind Go, by artists who are not glass artists, who often have never used glass, but here enter into this dialogue with the maestro. Uh, and I was talking earlier to Lucy Horta and she was telling me how much this has been for fascinating. She created a piece for the show and she enjoyed so much the relationship with the maestro, the freedom that it was giving her actually, and how glass gives you the possibility to explore forms, colors. Um, there is a, a diversity uh, in glass creation where you can make things that you couldn't make in another material. Then there is the question of female. To be honest, at the first when artists mentioned to me the, the, the show, uh, uh, artist who was work with Adriano and were going to be included in the, in the show. I said, well, you know, on our show with women artists. And then I spoke to Adriano and, you know, when you have 64 women artists, that's a strong statement, you know? And this is uh, a body of work in itself <laughs> of the studio behind Go, who through the, the past uh, three decades uh, have given women the opportunity to create in glass. Um, Women is you is very dear to my heart. It's one of my passion. I grew up in Paris. Uh, you know, the second sex was my Bible when I was 15. Uh, then I moved, moved to, the, to the States and was mentored by women like Eve Ansler, uh, who were the vagina monologues. Um, Francois Veritier, who was a French anthropologist who passed away a few years ago, was really one of my mentors. And Francoise is someone who has worked all our life. She was a pupil of, uh, of um, Claude Lévi-Strauss. And she worked on her life on what it means to be a woman, why there is violence against women, why there is discrimination uh, uh, on women, bringing all that to our body, to the function of our body, which is giving life, and uh, how the, the men actually just appropriated the female body as, as this reproductive uh, tool. So all these things I've always, I've always been really passionate about. And when I've asked the question, okay, what is the, what is the, the issues with female in the art world, why is it so hard for women in the art world? Well, it's hard for women in the art world because it's hard for women in the world. The world is designed for men. And it's not something, well, it, it's, it's not that we have to be an unwise man because I'm not at all, you know, it's a work we have to do together. But patriarchy as a structure makes it impossible really for women to be treated, treated as equal of, to men. There's not one situation. And I understood that when I was working with Agnes B, I was running a film, production. She's a woman who achieved a lot, you know, she's a, she became this bill, French billionaire, like making fashion. 
And even her, <laughs> you know, was always treated like second because she's a woman. So you always, it's always assumed that somehow you're less than the men in the room and you learn to live with it. It's, uh, you know, you're not gonna be thinking of that all day, otherwise you don't do anything. But here I'm really proud to be given the opportunity uh, by uh, Adriano to be part of a project where we make a strong statement with all these women who have created glass. But when you walk in, in the exhibition, you actually forgot it's an exhibition with women. It's just a good exhibition, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and Cohen, who really, you know, put the, the work together, uh, has, has done something really beautiful in creating the dialogue. He knows the space very well. And, um, and it's, it's not such an easy space, though it's a very beautiful space. And it's also a statement to be in Murano and not in Venice. But uh, the, the show works, you know, regardless of it is female or men. Well, no. Thank you. Sorry, that's that's too long. wonderful. No, I, I, hope, I hope those of us who are not sadly not in Venice feel very frustrated that we can't just come and see um, all this, this, uh, this, beautiful, um, this beautiful work. Um, I should say that um, I wholeheartedly kind of concur with everything you said and you know anyone who visits Murano regularly especially 20 years ago when I first started to go there you know th there were not so many women there having said that the first time I ever went to a furnace I was lucky enough to accompany one of the greatest artists in glass I think ever who was Lara de Santillana who mm -hmm. like, many of you will will know and she was she was an extraordinary person and it, tragically she passed away last year and her loss is, is beyond words um, to all of us. And I remember standing in the furnace with Laura, I'd never been to a furnace before, and she was working with the artisans to make one of her beautiful kind of minimalist sculptures. And, um, and she said to me, you know, she said, what you want is, is the mistakes. Glass is so fragile and so um, unpredictable that inevitably there are mistakes. But she said, if you're, if you're lucky and, you're, and you know what you're doing, you can, you can take the mistake and it will become more beautiful because of the mistake. And I always remember that, that you, know, you, look, you look for the imperfection rather than looking for perfection. Um, but uh, just to stay in the, this relationship between the maestro and the artist, which I think many of us are, are fascinated by because it, it makes glass a very unusual material. Um, uh, and so I thought Sudarshan, you know, you've, you've been to Murano several times, you've worked with artisans in the furnace. Um, it must have been a new experience for you. What can you tell us about what that experience of communicating, you know, with an artisan who'd worked with the material all his life, probably was a man, to, to create something in your imagination was like? I think, uh, yeah, you know, what Cohen uh, uh, refers to as confluence or merging of entities in that sense is something uh, that that kind of, it's, it's not about like a length of time that you spend there. It's, I think it's more to do with how you look at uh, a certain relationship forming through a certain activity uh, that's uh, that's uh, in place, uh, I think you know this was. Uh, uh, I, I I was like you know, I mean in the beginning I was like completely overawed by the kind of skill that they were uh, uh, that was there, and uh, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, it also, also can see that you know it has a kind of history and it comes from a longer. Uh, Kind of lineage that uh, this this kind of uh, only I mean that's only possible through that kind of you know uh, history that it has, and uh, it it is like quite overwhelming in the beginning to be to 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 believe that to, to or, or to understand that you are like you know you are dealing with something and you are in some way becoming a part of that, and uh, it is quite humbling in that sense and. Uh, yeah, I've, you know, to say the least, I've had like a great time, great learning time there. Yeah. And did you, did you, how did, I mean, when I was with Laura and I, I've been with other, other artists in, in the furnaces and quite often they, they seem to say what they want without actually using any words. I mean, Laura used to draw something on the floor in chalk. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been with artists who just maybe say one word, which to me is, just seems to be all the movement of the hand. I mean, did you make drawings? Did you take drawings with you, or did you? I, 
I went with, I mean, the first time I went with a few ideas and uh, only to kind of realize that, you know, none of them are going to work. <laughs> and then it became more like, you know, how can I follow this maestro and, you know, how can I kind of go along with the uh, process of things in that sense. So, I mean, there were a lot of drawings made uh, with the white chalk on the metal, yes. uh, you know, table that they have. Yes. Uh, and which is all erased. Uh, and then you found it. the... Yeah. Thank you. Um, how are we doing for time? We've got a bit, a bit, we've got a bit of time, haven't we, Camilla? Yes. Yes, we absolutely do, Rachel. Yeah. Um, maybe from, we'll move from, from, from making art to from making art and glass to, to curating it. I mean, Mario, when you curated Fragile, um, you, you were bringing together some very iconic artists, Joseph Boyce, Ai Weiwei, Marcel Duchamp, um, and what they had in common, you know, really was the material they were using, yes. glass. How did you, how did you approach that, that challenge well, of bringing them together? Well, uh, as I said, I, I was, when I was asked to do the exhibition, because I knew the kind of program that uh, the Stan Celebrator had, which is an extraordinary program on, on, on Murano, I thought maybe, you know, for once it would be interesting to do an exhibition about glass in contemporary art, which is not at all related to Murano. And, uh, and I then started exploring, the, the, you know, I, I, some works, you know, but, but are iconic, one remembers, uh, you know, for, for, they are, they are in really in, in collective memory, like, you know, Michael Craig Martin, Oak Tree, or, you know, or, or as you said, you know, Marcel Duchamp, we, we show the Air de Paris, which is, a, you know, a pharmacy, uh, how do you call it, a container, uh, which is basically empty, but because it was in Paris, uh, yeah, metaphorically contains the air of, of Paris and, uh, and other, other artists. Then I start, uh, you know, I, I do some research and I saw that, you know, other artists, uh, maybe, sometimes even once or, or very few times use glass in the, you know, in the, uh, in the works. And uh, so I tried to, to put a coherent story of this and, uh, and it wasn't coherent at all, but uh, uh, I think it was, uh, was, was interesting to, to, to show how, you know, what we said before and what also uh, the, the other People participating say that all, all, all these, you know, all these metaphorical elements that uh, uh, glass contains uh, have been used by, you know, the, the, uh, a big variety of artists for for different reasons, uh, for you know, in different ways. But you know, so, you know, sooner or later, someone has used glass in their in their career, and I thought that was that was that was interesting, and uh, and. Uh, that was, you know, um, I think that was the success of the show. The fact that it didn't really have a, you know, a coherent narrative, but was just, you know, a collection of works by different artists, which, you know, were working glass with different meaning, but somehow, you know, we were able to, to, to construct a sort of itinerary with that. Uh, I think it didn't make sense. But, you know, glass is, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it talks loud. And, and so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it works. I mean, I think people respond to glass. Um, I think all, all of us here sound as if we're quite passionate about it. And, um, you know, it, it has that quality of being alive as a material and mutable. And of course it's, you know, it's very elemental. It's moving through fire, water, um, and obviously air. And it, it makes it very different from any other material. And I mean, Kuhn, talking to you and, and looking at some of the work you've, you've made and, and the shows you've curated and obviously your extraordinary um, history with Glass Dress, which I think I mean, we can say that Glass Dress kind of broke the mold as an exhibition which really focused on glass as a material for international contemporary artists. And um, you know, I remember the first one I saw at Palazzo, the first Glass Dress exhibition I saw at Palazzo Franchetti in Venice, um, I think it was 2007 perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, you know, it was quite clear that here was um, not just one or two artists using glass as, uh, as a means of, of expressing themselves, but um, such a big group of artists and the diversity in the work was extraordinary. But as somebody who's really followed and, um, and uh, nourished, if you like, that, um, 
that uh, that conversation with with Glass. I mean, how do you do? You have any sense of what the future might bring for this relationship between Glass and 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 contemporary artists? Um, yes, I think I think the. Um, um, I think if, I, if I'm looking to the world, you know, that everything has to become more lighter. If you look to architecture, for example, yeah. when, you, when you make a building, uh, I, I would say that the half of two thirds of the building is become glass. So that was not the case in the, in the past. So there is a kind of, uh, the material is a future material. Um, as, as a little joke, I always said, there is only one uh, technology that can look through a window. It's a, it's a, it's a window itself. Um, and I think, I think that we, in one way, have a, in one way have an, or another, we are, we are feeling that, um, that, we, that, we, that we have uh, the capacity to look inside. If you look to science, you know, it inside, it's more uh, transparent, it's more fragile, it's more, and in my opinion, the translation of that kind of feeling happens in glass. If you look to the exhibition Glass Dress, but also now Unbreakable Women in Glass, there is a lot about the fragility of life, but not in a way of being, um, uh, of being weak, but um, from inside, something gives shape on the outside. And I like that very much because that's for me the definition of beauty. And um, if, I'm, if I'm looking to, uh, how, how do you work with glass? You work with glass in a way that you also have to break the brain of the master. You have to help as an, as an artist, you help to break the brain. So that means that you have to break the glass as well. In the, if you curate uh, an exhibition with glass, it's not about finding a balance, it's finding the point of breaking uh, where you take the audience uh, with you um, and, and to, 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 to look at something and then all of a sudden you're out of control. Now, again, with this show, Unbreakable Women in, in Glass, you're out of control. You're not in control. You, you not enter a space um, and, and you feel immediately like, oh, uh, this, is, um, uh, this is something sweet. No, there is something beautiful which is going on. And Glass is a real seducer to that. And that's why glass is so damn dangerous to work with, because if you if you think that it seduces you, uh, like I said before, that that's one who one glass who is manipulated to be uh, at the end something smooth and something uninteresting. But if you enter enter an exhibition of glass, there is always something dangerous there, uh, something that you may not touch, something that you may not see and and in my opinion that's also what life is life is not always happiness it's also full of tears it's full of fear it's full of pain but it's also full of beauty and in my opinion this is um this is what glass is doing and for the future it's a translation of life and in contemporary art in one way or another the artist wants to come as close as possible to real life, to nature. But if it's nature, it is nature. Eh? It, so you have to find this particularly line where, you, where you're on, which is uh, very dangerous to balance, you know? And um, art comes from artificial, so it is human, it is human, so you have to find the balance between your culture and your nature and you have to walk on that very thin line and glass has the ability to tell that story that's beautifully put beautifully put Nadia, yes, yeah, please, um, on. <laughs> no because i think it was really interesting i mean obviously what cohen says is always interesting but um it's it shows <laughs> some some of your point of view really shows how the female and uh, masculine approach is as different it can be because from many conversations I have with feminine artists, the relationship with the maestro is actually not into breaking his brain. It's more like entering the brain and started this dance with him, you know? It's being done in this kind of, there's a centrality to this relationship. 
and understand, you know, like, yeah, it's a dance. It's mm. a corps à corps. Yeah. <laughs> a very smooth and, um, and to let go. It, it's, it's a lot about letting go and trusting also the, the maestro. Um, so, well, I, I can't talk for all artists, but for diff various discussion I had with artists who are in this exhibition, this is more their approach to the relationship with the maestro. Uh, the maestro, but, you know, again, the, the Fonacci is, is, is a very strong masculine space where I can see <laughs> Cohn with all his strength, you know, it, 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 it creates a different dynamic than when you have a woman there, for sure. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. Actually, I just want to refer Sudarshan to, you, you sent me some images of the pieces you made recently on Murano, and I thought they were all beautiful, but the one really struck me was, I think it's called Outside the Bubble, but it's a piece of glass which is kind of drooping very dangerously over a, is it a metal table? I've lost, I can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just. Yes. Yeah. It's a, it is a metal table, yeah. It is a metal. I mean, I just thought it was such a fantastic piece because it, it literally looks like the glass is about to fall and break onto the floor and it just sort of falls over the, the edge. And I just wondered if you could say something about how you, how you managed to, to make that or, or get it made, you know, work with the artisans to create that. Yeah, this was uh, this was a very very kind of uh, specific kind of shape okay. uh, that I wanted to uh, kind of achieve, uh, and and it, it became like a challenge for the maestro, and I think they broke a few before. Okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it was a hard one to make, uh, believe it or not. I mean, it looks simple, and I thought that it was you know so easy to make. But it did take a huge amount of skill uh, yeah. to be able to achieve that. So going back to the idea of it uh, came from uh, what I said earlier, you know, with the, you know, like also kind of understanding that, you know, kind of it looks like it's going to fall off, you know, fall off the table uh, and possibly break. So it's a way of, you know, bringing in its imminent uh, collapse or, or its breakage into the work uh, that you are aware of both its stasis and its movement at the same time its uh, possible demise of the object in that sense so it's placing in that kind of you know, uh, gray zone wherever that kind of fits in into your in your experience of it. Oh, it, was a, it was it was a beautiful it's a beautiful piece of work um I think we we probably had our allotted time for chatting, but is there anything anyone um, would like to say? You know, a, a question maybe that I haven't asked. If any of you would like to sort of just highlight something, please feel free. Um, there's something I have missed out. Can I? Yeah, please. I I just want to um, I think that um, um, just to make a remark on what Nadia also was was saying. Uh, it's not necessary that the dance um, doesn't break the, re the, 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 the relationship. Um, I, I mean, if you break, that means that you go to another, you go to another level of understanding. And in my opinion, this is the level of, of a new understanding. And yes, it is true that of course, that when a man is entering the furnace. You have the macho of the maestro. You have to, uh, you have to seduce him in another way. Then there is a woman in the furnace. Um, so also there, she has to, she has to come in another way to this. I think that that can be a difference. But at the end, as Nadia said in the show, you don't feel uh, really that it's only women. It's about good pieces. And I see that the results of these pieces come from. Uh, from the same, actually, maybe not the same way of going, but the same result of being. And that's, in my opinion, was also a good idea to have the, uh, to curate a show with, uh, with a man and a woman. Uh, so that, especially if you talk about Mirano as being an island, uh, it's a kind of uh, new beginning of something. It's, uh, it's a kind of new seeds for, uh, for another future. So this is this is what I felt when 
when we were making this show. And that's also immediately an answer also of another future as well, because um, we are facing another future today, also through the pandemic, you know, from, uh, from a zero point, which, which, is, uh, which is about restorement, I think, which is uh, very close uh, to the female energy in one way or another. Mm. But precisely the, the female energy is very much about the collaboration and feeling the other energy and kind of pl playing with the energy yeah. of someone you have in front of you. Uh, but about the NIST, yeah, that actually that was something I didn't say at the beginning, but that was also for me an important point. It's, uh, it's an honor to be part of such a beautiful project in the NIST in this moment in time uh, where we can see the future we hope for Venice, and we can see the possibility of this. Um, and Murano definitely needs, you know, a new direction. The elements are there. You know, there's young people doing amazing things here. There's an organization like the Consortium del Vetro, Consortium del Vetro, who really have a vision for the a future for Murano of excellence and modernity. And there's also we haven't talked about new technologies, but new technology open a new. Um, uh, window for glass, and you had this prize, uh, the Venice Glass Week with the Autonoma Prize, with this young guy, and I'm sorry I forgot the name, but that have created objects using uh, the co computer science, basically. Um, so there's a lot that can be done, uh, and so Murano needs to be supported, supported by artists, by collectors who come here and create pieces, or well, you have someone like Adriano Berengo who is, who is doing a very important work on the, on the island, but there's, you know, there's uh, different people. But that, Venice is definitely in this moment where this place that is unique in the world, unique in human history, can find a new direction where creativity, where the creativity of the people here, the intellectual life that is here with the university, the Institute of Marine Science. I mean, it, it's a very vivid city and it has to keep going like this and not at this place where, where we have seen that, you know, it's transformed some time into a Luna Park, mm. which, is, uh, which is a shame for the world, you know, and it's, uh, it's, it's because this is not what Venice is about. Venice is a place really for high quality of thinking and creativity. Suppose it's, it's just worth saying, um, so I'm, I'm aware that, you know, most of us um, have, you know, our experience of, of glass and art, um, or certainly glass art, in, in Murano. Um, uh, but of course, um, you know, glass is, is made and used by artists all over the world, and, and many of them, as I think, Mario, you touched on this, but you might like to say a few more words. I mean, there are artists who are working with industrial glass, you know, who, who don't work in, in furnaces. Yes, or, or, have used, or have used industrial glass. Yeah. I mean, would you like to say a few a few words so, about quite that? Quite rightly, one. We lost Mario. Hello. Can Hello. you hear me? Uh, Hello. Yes. I can. Yeah. I think. I think you've frozen on your screen. But if you speak. Sure. Sorry. No, no, uh, you're frozen as well. That's why I was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's why. Okay. I thought I was frozen myself. Um, no, it's it, it's interesting because you know, glass, in a way, isn't a design an industrial uh, material. I mean, it has been used since the Neolithic, but, you know, always, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in such a small scale. And then, of course, it's the Industrial Revolution that brought glass to, you know, the, the use that we, um, what, what we know today. And, of course, you know, Crystal Palace or Grand Palais in Paris were, you know, the wonder of uh, architecture in the 19th century. And uh, um, so a, a, a lot of artists have used uh, industrial glass to, as I said, to explain, uh, to explain concepts also of uh, somehow uh, neutrality, because even though it's, it's a man-made material, we think of it as part of nature somehow. I mean, we think that glass is a natural material. Uh, and uh, this makes it somehow uh, neutral. And a lot of, uh, oh, if you like a thermal and a lot of artists have used it as a, um, as, as a metaphor for this reason. Um, in the show, uh, for example, Gary Richter, who always have worked on the, on the, you know, the concept of, uh, of vision, how we look through, uh, you know, how we look at things, 
um, made these sculptures of, which is a series of glass panels, um, you know, placed uh, vertically one after the other, and uh, somehow uh, you interact uh, directly with exhibition space and, and, and the other uh, spectators that happen to be in the room and somehow reverses the idea of painting, which has always been the, you know, his preoccupation. Uh, then we show a work uh, by Joseph Boyce, which uh, related to the earthquake in, uh, in Naples. And, you know, there was smashed glass on the, on, uh, on the floor, which gave the idea of, you know, destruction. And, uh, but obviously Boyce uh, being an artist, which, you know, was very connected with uh, the history of Germany. Uh, it has also, uh, you know, uh, a connection with the, the crystal act, the night of the crystals in the um, in Germany in the 30s. And, uh, you know, other had used it, you know, as, as a material even for conceptual art, as we, we mentioned Michael Craig Martin, the famous, you know, oak tree, which is basically a glass full of water. Uh, and uh, uh, Michael invites the the, the viewer uh, to to imagine that that is an oak tree, uh, and uh, then you know Joseph Kosut, for example, um, you know, uh, uh, Joseph told me that had, he has used glass again because it was possibly one of the most you know neutral uh, 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 material he could think of, uh, and so you know that that one would only concentrate on the concept of the world rather than you know any aesthetic uh, value. And it's basically, you know, uh, four glasses. When it, was, it, 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 it says clear square glass leaning. So it just, you know, a tautology, a definition of what you are actually looking without adding anything else. And uh, then we will, uh, of course, we couldn't avoid showing Wallet Betsy, uh, you know, glass uh, traveling FedEx uh, all over the world and arrived, uh, you know. Uh, not in one piece, <laughs> uh, but you know it's it's uh, it's a metaphor, of course, of uh, of today, you know, uh, moving places, and uh, and then uh, you know Monaha tombs, uh, uh, broken bottles uh, on the floor, uh, you know, but they were like you know sort of metaphor or the message of the bottle of of of, uh, of literature, uh, and of course you know the sharpness of uh, of the of the glass. Uh, reinforce that concept. And then uh, we had uh, Monica Bonvicini's security glass, uh, which was, you know, security glass, which, you know, broke, which was attempted to be, to be broken, but of course it, it resisted, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and you know, it's, it's, it was a, an extraordinary uh, metaphor for, you know, any discourse on uh, security and, uh, you know, surveillance. Um, so again, artists have used glass in, 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 in all sorts of ways, thanks to you know, this, this, this amazing capacity of, of, uh, of metaphorizing um, these courses. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it really is an extraordinary material for, um, for metaphor. It's such a generous material in that sense, isn't it? I mean, you can, it, 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 it just lends itself to so many different um, ideas and um, and possibilities. I think sadly, I feel like we could probably just go on talking, but sadly, I think we've probably run out of time. Um, so thank you so much to all of you. It's been a real pleasure for me to, to, to be part of this and, and hear what you have to say. Um, you've got such different experiences of, of working with glass, but um, they were really rich and fascinating. And all I can say is that I hope it will be next time, same time next year, but in Venice. Um, yeah. Other than in all our little, I think I think Mario and Nadia, you're in Venice, aren't you? Yes. And Mario's in Venice, and Camilla's in Venice, but the rest of us aren't. So anyway, but no, thank you very much. And, well, we um, miss you a lot. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel. Absolutely. Well, no, thank you, Rachel. Thank you all for joining us um, for thank this. You genuinely interesting conversation really so wonderful to have such an eminent group of figures um, from around the world talking obviously about your very very different perspectives about this topic which as Rachel said really you know contemporary glass and art it's obviously so important within the context of the glass week Venice glass week and really far too big I suppose for just one hour but thanks to Rachel's very thoughtful questions we touched on and explored 
so many fascinating and thought-provoking aspects, which really is tantalizing. And yes, please, please come back and join us this time next year in Venice, and we'll have to continue the discussion in, per <laughs> in person. We'll, we'll live stream it for everyone else. Um, yes. So yes, Rachel, Kuhn, uh, Mario, Sudarshan, and Nadja, really appreciate your time, especially if you're in Venice or London or somewhere where it's sunny. I know a Saturday afternoon is a, a tricky time to, to talk. And obviously for Sudarshan, I know it's quite late at night for you in Mumbai. So really, really grateful for your contributions. Um, and obviously to our sponsor, Apice, um, represented today with the Apice's managing director, Fabiano. We're so grateful to you for supporting our program and enabling us to open the festival up this year to a, a more international audience, um, even if people aren't able to be here. Um, tomorrow will be the final uh, session in our program. And that's going to be on the topic of why glass now the relevance of glass today in art, craft, and design. Um, that is going to be at 5 p.m. Venice time. And that's going to be moderated by Jean Blanchard, who is a curator and member of the Venice Glass Week's curatorial committee. We've also got a wonderful, another wonderful lineup of speakers, um, Alberto Cavalli, who is the executive director of the Michelangelo Foundation for Creativity and Craftsmanship, which is responsible for the incredible Homo Faber exhibition um, that we're hoping will come back to Venice next year, as well as being the general director of the Fondazione Cologni dei Mestieri d'Arte. We've also got artists Monica Gugersberg and Philip Baldwin, as well as Rinaldo Invernizzi, who's president of the historic uh, glass company Barovia Tozzo, and finally Maurizio Musatti, founding partner of Wonder Glass. So if you've enjoyed this afternoon's talk and you think that sounds interesting, do please join us um, tomorrow at five, or indeed you might like to take a look at some of the other topics that we've been discussing um, this week, um, which is recorded and, and there for you to enjoy on the, the Venice Glass Week YouTube channel, talking about various topics, including women in glass, specifically, um, Collecting Glass Today, Venice and American Studio Glass, which is the exhibition, the blockbuster exhibition at the, um, at the Le Standard del Vetro, which is highly to be recommended, as well as, as, well as a talk that Apice handled um, a couple of days ago, Fragile, Handle with Care, the Fine Art of Transporting Glass. So yes, um, a, real, a real range of topics, um, all of which are connected to artistic glass. So. Um, Finally, though, thank you so much in particular to our wonderful moderator, Rachel, and all of our speakers. And we really, really look forward to seeing you all in person, hopefully before too long here in Venice. So thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 B